Welcome to this video and in this video I wanted to have a look at rogue planets and how they form. So firstly let's just kind of recap what we normally think a planet is. So the definition of a planet which I did a separate video on is that it should orbit a star it should be big enough to have a spherical shape, so the gravitational forces mould it into a spherical shape. And it should again be big enough that it gravitationally clears out a, its local neighbourhood in its orbit. So that's what we would classify as a normal planet. We're quite familiar with those in our solar system. But then we have these rogue planets which we're starting to discover as we look into space. Now a rogue planet or a free-floating planet is not gravitationally bound to any star, so it's not orbiting any star. So we, we classify it as free-floating, it just means that it's not on a orbit around a star, it's just moving through space essentially as an object on its own, so it will move accordingly um, in our galaxy or even outside of our galaxy. So these don't have a host star. Now part of the problem is we know that the majority of planets, or the standard planet formation theories, suggest that planets form in disks around young stars. So we've got some images there taken of these planetary disks, or these um, disks around stars, that are still forming planets. So we've found lots of those, we've imaged them, and some of those features in those disks suggest that there's planets there as well. So some of them you can see they've actually got gaps in the, in the disks, they've got ring structures there. And these can be indicative of planets forming in the disk itself. So we assume that planets typically form in disks around young stars, which would then suggest that they then orbit the stars once the stars finish forming and the disk is then dissipated. So during that particular process in the disk as they're forming, planets can wander or migrate, which is fairly common actually, and it's classified as planetary migration. There's a few different types of migration which I'll do separate videos on but basically they evolve with the disk or the interaction between the planet and the disk causes them to move inwards or outwards and it depends on the planet, the disk, where they are, what it actually does but the point being is the planet will pull on the disk gravitationally, the disk does the same effect on the planet and there's normally an imbalance of forces which means that it gets pushed in or out so the orbit changes of that planet when it's still growing in the disk basically. There's also tidal evolution so once that disk has dissipated and the disk is no longer there then the planet's orbit and rotation can be changed due to a tidal evolution so we know that the moon is tidally locked it means that its rotation period is the same as its orbital period. So one face always faces the same way towards. And the same thing happens with planets. So you can get a tidal locking. It also changes their orbit. So if you had an elliptical orbit, so where a planet has a fairly elliptical orbit like this, it will be closer to the star in one part of its orbit and further away in another and when it's closest the tidal forces from that star are the greatest which causes a larger deformation of the planet so basically stretches it at that point when it's on the other part so when it's furthest away on that elliptical orbit then the tidal forces are the least when it's furthest away so actually it kind of relaxes a little bit so during one orbit it gets pulled apart and then it kind of relaxes again to this stretching or this periodic stretching occurs of the planet that causes an internal heating and that orbital energy that it had on its elliptical orbit is dissipated then as heat in the actual planet itself and that causes a change in its orbit now it can either move inwards or outwards again it's kind of specific to the system in question but the point is it can change the orbit it can make it more circular and it can change its semi-major axis which is essentially its orbital radius. So that's another way that planets can change their orbit. And this happens during the kind of evolutionary process. So planets don't stay where they form. Now, the problems arise when you have multiple planets in a system. So if, if one of those planets or the planets are wandering about, it means that they can get closer to each other and they will gravitationally perturb each other. So if they get closer to each other when they pass by, they're going to exert a larger gravitational force, which then starts to impact their own orbits. So as they pass each other, they can actually then begin to alter their own orbits. So an example here, as they get closer, the orbits get closer to one another. As they pass by each other, they exert a larger gravitational force on each other. 
Now, the smaller of those planets is going to have the larger change in its orbit. And it's actually known as a gravitational scattering event when they get close enough. And one of them can be scattered outwards or inwards on a completely different orbit. So it most likely it will be the smaller planet, but it will get scattered onto a completely different orbit. Um, so in, in the least significant case, it still remains on an orbit around the star. But let's say it gets scattered outwards. It's on a more elliptical orbit and it gets thrown further out. So it's now put onto a new orbit further out due to this gravitational scattering event. And actually, we found quite a few planets around other stars that have very elliptical orbits, which are likely going to have been formed from this gravitational scattering event. Now, the worst case you know, is when one of them is actually completely thrown out of the system. And again, this is not a particularly rare scenario. We expect this to happen, I say relatively common, it's not. A very rare occurrence so one of these planets could get ejected from the system completely it will then no longer be on an orbit around the star this is then known as a rogue planet so this will be free floating in space without any attachment to a star and plenty of systems are thought to do this but how do we actually detect them so we know there's been you know a few hundred you know, hundreds have been detected that are rogue planets without a star, and we typically detect them using micro lensing. So, micro lensing is kind of a, a similar effect to gravitational lensing. So, the image here is showing a galaxy cluster which obviously has a very large amount of mass. So, as light passes over it, through it from a distant galaxy, the light is bent around we can then measure or look at that distorted light and we can work out um, information about the background galaxy and the galaxy cluster. But you can do a smaller scale version of that with planets. So here you're going to look at a background star, you have a lens star and then a, a planet orbiting that star. As it drifts in front of the background star, the gravitational lensing of that star in the middle it slightly magnifies the background star, so it appears slightly brighter. And a plot of that over time is shown at the bottom. So as it drifts across, it will get slightly brighter and then dim back down again. If it has a planet, then you get a spike as the planet passes in front of the star as well. However, this can be used purely just for a planet. So this is one technique for discovering exoplanets. But if you've got no lens star there and you just have the planet, then you get a similar effect. Obviously, the smaller the object, the less the effect you get. But it's uh, one of the methods we've used that's detected the majority of these rogue planets orbiting, or well, not orbiting, well, they'll be orbiting the galaxy, but they won't be orbiting stars. And here's an example plot, really. So if you had a lens star and a planet orbiting that lens star, you'd get this typical shape where it would increase in brightness of the background star. You get a sudden spike for the planet, and then it dims back down again. And if you want to see what that actually looks like, then here is an example of one of these background stars increasing in brightness. And then there will be some companions to that star, which then cause a spike. And you can see how that, that brightens, and then it dims back down. Now, this is a bit of a problem for detecting them because we only typically get one detection of the system as it drifts in front. It's not like a normal exoplanet where you, you know the period and you can get multiple measurements. This is typically a one-time event, so they're quite difficult to detect, and they're likely going to be quite rare. But still, we have detected a few hundred. So here's an example of an Earth mass one, which is a free-floating rogue planet. And this is the typical shape of the background star as it drifted in front. So we've got the magnification of that background star. And from that, you can work out the mass of that planet. And it was calculated to be around the mass of earth which is quite exciting actually because you've got an earth mass planet floating around in space that's not orbiting a star and that's there's a whole range of planets that are out there without stars up to you know gas giant sort of size and smaller down to earth mass which is quite exciting because where did they originally come from now the interesting thing is did our solar system produce a rogue planet now, at the moment, we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, our four gas giants towards the outer part of the system. But to replicate what we currently have, 
one of the best ideas really is to have a fifth gas giant and then that is ejected out or it is scattered outwards and it explains the configuration that we have so the question is did we produce a rogue planet in our in the early parts of our solar system you know was it thrown out not quite far enough to be a rogue planet which then could explain planet x because there's something interesting happening towards the outer part of the system with some objects moving in a bit of a cluster which supposedly requires um, an additional planet further out now could it be that that fifth planet was gravitationally scattered early on but it wasn't thrown out far enough to be detached from the sun so it could be interesting or was it actually thrown out and it is now a rogue planet I guess until we find it, we won't know. But there is a secondary process which could create rogue planets. They're not always going to be ejected from a planetary system. They could form on their own from a very small cloud. So the collapse of these clouds of gas is typically what forms a star. And then you get the planets forming around the star. But if you had a much smaller cloud of gas and that collapsed and there wasn't enough mass there for it to become a star, then there is the potential that this could just be a rogue planet. There's not enough there for it to become a star, so instead it actually just collapses down to be a single planet. So that was that is another scenario, but what I'll do is I'll do a separate video on that particular scenario and how that might create a rogue planet. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoy, then check out some of the other videos.